what happens is um, because of going to the affinity group or that place, uh, which tends to have people more like that, um, then, for example, the richer people move to places that more richer people um, are in and tend to protect wealth more. And as a result of that, the tax base moves. And as a result of the tax base moves, there becomes a hollowing out that produces a dynamic. It's more difficult to have public services. Um, the, the circumstances get worse. And then that produces its own dynamic that makes that conflict worth, worse, and that becomes a less hospitable place to be, which creates a force to move, which reinforces that cycle. That's right. That's how it works. That's how it works mechanistically. Right. No, that makes sense. Because if I let's say I'm let's say I'm doing pretty well, I live in Michigan or whatever where I grew up, and I realize, hey, you know, I need I'm so sick of paying high taxes. I'm going to vote somebody in office that doesn't do that. And now we have bad roads, bad schools, bad policing like Detroit did or does. And then everybody who has money says, I'm going to move to Bloomfield Hills or a suburb or just an enclave that's nicer. But we don't have enough cops. Let's just do a private security force for our area. And you know what? We're going to redo the roads. It'll be private. We're going to buy this up and take it out of city hands. And my kids are all going to go to private schools because if you've seen the public schools, they're terrible. You can't even go there. They have metal detectors. People are getting stabbed. So then the people who can't afford to live in that enclave live in the equivalent of Baghdad or Fallujah or whatever. I mean, I'm it's a hyperbole, but they live in a place where the schools are bad, the roads are bad, and there's no cops. I'm, 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 it, and it's not very much hyperbole. Um, uh, I'm, I described Connecticut. Uh, I live in uh, Greenwich, Connecticut, and the public school system spends about $24,000 per student per year. Right up the road are towns like Bridgeport, Connecticut, in which they spend something like $14,000 a year per school. And if you drive around the neighborhood, it does look as you're describing, and there's poverty. And in order, they need more remediation than they need more money, not less mm -hmm. money, because they have an environment and a set of circumstances where there's poverty, not just schools. And then that particular, that, so it's like you're describing, right? It's not, there's a certain amount of hyperbole, but not much hyperbole in a lot of places. The place where my dad grew up, there's no, I'm going to, I'm trying to get this right. I believe there's no trash pickup. It, it'll take the cops something like days to get to you. I mean, literally, they, they're not starting to drive there as soon as you call it in. They just might not show up at all. And it might be an hour because there's like 28 square miles or something that they have to cover. And 80 cop cars, something along those lines. It's just absolutely ridiculous. And the power system is damaged in a lot of areas. There are entire blocks where one house has two old people in it or an old person in it or two houses do, and every other house is abandoned. So they don't service that place with things like sanitation or fresh roads or pretty much anything. And people, They're on their own. People don't understand that uh, because we, um, a lot of people live, you know, they're in Greenwich, Connecticut. How much time do they go 15 minutes up the road and go to Bridgeport, Connecticut. My wife, another, another, uh, the state capital of Connecticut is Hartford, Connecticut, used to be the insurance capital of the world. Um, and it's now, in, it has that type of thing. Um, and my wife is working to you know try to work, help that population. She's with the mayor and they're um, in this um, control room kind of thing where they have the cameras on different places. And there are kids who uh, have a problem walking to school because they have to pass through areas where there are gangs that have gang shootings. And she asks the mayor, um, well, why can't you have the police a sure, safe passage? He said there are 275 police. I, uh, that's all we can afford because there's police or this thing and that, and it's just what you're describing. So there is a, how does this take place? It's a reality. It's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's a reality. Not everywhere, but if people need to get around and look at these things or look at the statistics. The values gap is is also something you mentioned quite a bit, not just the wealth gap, the values gap. And you touched on this a little bit earlier, but I'd love to hear more about this because it does seem more and more, especially if you pay attention to anything online, 
that the United States is not only dealing with a wealth gap that's quite obvious, but a values gap that is totally different. And each side calls the other side immoral and feels like they're completely in the wrong slash evil. You mentioned before, people will say, well, poor people should work harder, but billionaires are evil, depending on who you ask. And that that's a huge problem if people actually believe really either of those kinds of things uh, well, all, wholesale. All, all, the, all the surveys show that um, um, uh, large majority, really, if, if you would take the population, um, it is in the, there's a middle, uh, but if you take that, those that have fundamentally big, big differences in terms of demonizing the other, say, I don't want to be with the other, those kinds of things, it represents something like 60% of the population. That's not made up. Um, that is um, a reality. That's, and, and you see that demonization in these patterns. And you see how it works with the media, okay? So there's a dynamic that you see repeat over and over again. So the uh, and the media, and certainly true today, um, um, also likes to sensationalize and be on one side or the other and demonize. And so to find out what's true and to balance things, uh, like what are the pros and cons, is not really common. It, it barely exists. And, and, and it's difficult. It's, you know, it's not easy to be in talking about the reasonableness and the issues of both sides and to try to deal with the merit of both sides. I guarantee you, it's like the, like the history, they, you know, they, the middle gets gar- guillotined, <laughs> nailed to the cross or <laughs> imprisoned or shot. Do you remember, well, it's a little bit before my time. I don't know how familiar you are with this. You might not have been paying attention, but like the fairness doctrine. Are you familiar with that at all in media? It was essentially that if you ran two hours with a conservative, you had to run two hours with somebody who was effectively on the other side of the debate. It wasn't um, always exact. Well, but- I, I, um, I didn't. Uh, yeah, I, I, I have a recollection of that. I knew um, through my whole experience that the vast majority of the population of audience and media wouldn't have it otherwise by and large, that it was basically the notion of um, accuracy and not partisanship was, Mm -hmm. was fundamental. If you like that clip and you want to see more just like this, subscribe to our channel for more or click on the videos on screen now. To see full-length episodes, check out our main channel in the description below.